Good evening and welcome to Calvary Chapel. Will you stand with me, please? Father, we meet again with you. We look to you, your Holy Spirit, Jesus, to open up our ears, our minds, our hearts. Lord, we desire to connect with you in spirit and truth. Bring illumination to our hearts. Grant us the grace that leads us to repentance in the area that we might need to repent. And fill us with joy, that everlasting joy, knowing that in you we are accepted, we are loved, and we are kept. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. King and kingdoms will bow down Every chain will break As broken hearts declare His praise For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion The Lion of Judah Fighting our battles, every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, every knee will bow before Every knee will bow before Him. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, every knee will bow before Him. Every knee will bow before Him. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. For the sins of the world, his blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him.
Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We're here to praise our God and hear your word, Lord. It's about you, Lord Jesus, and we thank you and praise you for all your love and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, you endure my pain. Savior, you bore all my shame. All because of your love. Maker of the universe. Broken for the sins of the earth. All because of your love. All because of your love. Because of your cross, my death is paid. Because of your blood, my sins will wash away. Now all of my life, I freely give. Because of your love, because of your love, I live. Innocent and holy King You died to set the captives free All because of your love Lord, you gave your life for me So I will live my life for you All because of your love All because of your Because of your cross, my debt is paid. Because of your blood, my sins are washed away. Now all of my life, I freely give. Because of your love, because of your love, I live. Oh, I live. Lord, I live. You did it for me, you did it for love, it's your victory, Jesus you are enough. You did it for me, you did it for love, it's your victory, Jesus you are enough. You did it for me, you did it for love, it's your victory, Jesus you are enough. You did it for me, you did it for love, it's your victory, Jesus you are enough, because of your cross my debt is paid, because of your blood my sins are washed away, now all of my life I freely give, because of your love. Because of your love, I live. Oh, I live. Thank you, Jesus, I live. Oh, Oh, the Lord, my strength and song, highest praise to Him belong. Christ the Lord, our conquering King, Your name we raise, Your triumph sing. Praise the Lord, our mighty warrior. Praise the Lord, the glorious one. By his hand we stand in victory, by his name we overcome. Though 
the storms of hell pursue in darkest night we worship you you divide the raging sea from death to life you safely lead praise the lord our mighty warrior praise the lord the glorious one by his hand we stand in victory by his name we overcome all the saints and angels bow host of heaven crying out glory glory to the king you reign for all eternity praise the lord our mighty warrior praise the lord the glorious one by his hand we stand in victory by his name we overcome the lord shall reign forever and ever 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 praise the lord our mighty warrior praise the lord the glorious one by his hand we stand in victory by his name we overcome. Hallelujah. God is good. You are good. You hear me when I call. You are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night. It cannot hide the light. Whom shall I fear? You crush the enemy underneath my feet. You are my sword and shield. Though troubles linger still, whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. My strength is in your name, for you alone can save. You will deliver me from the victory. Whom shall I be? Whom shall I be? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind The God of angel armies Is always by my side The one who reigns forever He is a friend of mine The God of angel armies Is always by my side And nothing for me against me will stand you hold the whole world in your hand 
I'm holding on to your promises. You are faithful. You are faithful. I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. To everlasting, you are God. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. In holiness, you stand secure. Through culture's shifting sands Unchanged by all the vanities of men And as the nations rise and fall Your sovereignty remains You are You are You are the one true God Everlasting to everlasting, you are God. From everlasting, hallelujah, Lord, to everlasting, you are God. In faithfulness, your love extends to times of turbulence. Adopting those who call upon your name. And every generation joins in song of grateful praise. You are, you are, you are the one true God and everlasting to everlasting you are a God from everlasting to everlasting you are a God Eternal, immortal, invisible God. Eternal, immortal, invisible God. From everlasting to everlasting, you are a God. From everlasting to everlasting, you are a God. God, you are God. Hallelujah. You 
are God. Little mortal flesh, you keep silent. And with fear and trembling stand Ponder nothing earthly minded Or with blessing in your hand Christ our God to God descended Our full heart to demand King of kings yet born of Mary as of all on earth he stood Lord of lords in human vesture in the body and the blood He will give to all the faithful His own self for heavenly food Rank on rank the host of heaven Spread his vanguard on the way As the light of light descends From the realms of endless day That the powers of hell may vanish as the darkness clears away At his feet the six winged seraph Cherubim with sleepless eyes Fill their faces to his presence As with sleepless voice they cry Alleluia, Alleluia Alleluia, Lord Most High Hallelujah, Lord. We praise you, God Most High. We thank you, Lord, for loving sinners like us, Lord. We thank you and praise you and honor you, Lord. We want to hear your word, meet with you, Lord, and just be with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Okay. Um, tonight we're looking at Joel chapter 2, verses 1 through 17. Now, it's the title of the message is The Coming Day of the Lord. It is really a warning to escape the coming judgment. As I've said before, God always warns before wrath. Let's open in prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you speak through your word. And Father, we recognize that we need ears to hear, hearts that are open and attuned to you. So we ask that you remove the distractions, the preconceived thoughts that we might have. Help us to recognize there's a time of judgment coming for Israel, 
for every man. Help us to take this seriously as we look at our text tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. As we're going through the prophets, the one thing that I want you to really keep in mind, and that's, first of all, that ten times in the prophets, they warn about the the coming judgment is coming near. Now, its main emphasis is really that day of trouble, that time of Jacob's trouble, that day of the Lord. Some will say the day of the Lord is any time that God comes down and he works with man and he disciplines man. And in a sense, that's true in the fact that God is judging man or disciplining man. But there is a time of judgment that's coming. It's called the day of the Lord or Jacob's trouble. Seven years of tribulation that will come upon this world. Now, when you come to this text, there are going to be different views I want you to consider because you're going to hear them from different people. And first, some are going to say this is not the day of the Lord in the sense of that great day of the Lord that we're going to see. But it's really a continuation of chapter 1, the locusts. How the locusts had come into the land and God was judging them. But follow with me in Psalm chapter 9, verse 8, and he will judge the world in righteousness, and he will execute judgment for the peoples with equity. And then in Psalm 96, 13, before the Lord, for he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth, and he will judge the world in righteousness and the people in his faithfulness. And then in Psalm 98, 9, before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth, and he will judge the world in righteousness. You, you hear that same thing from the people of equity. In that day, the Lord will be the king over the whole earth. This is the time that we're talking about the millennial kingdom. When this comes, when Jesus Christ rules and reigns, he'll come back at the end of the, the great tribulation. Come back, the church will come back. And there'll be a time that the sheep and the goats are separated and God will fulfill every promise again to Israel that he's given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But what's important to understand that that time could come at any time. We don't know if we have another moment, another day. Just as he's dealing with Israel, he will deal with us and we will face the judge. Maybe as a believer, Maybe as an unbeliever. This is something that we have to search our own hearts. We have to examine our hearts and see, are we right with God? Do we really have a relationship? Now, Zechariah 14.9 says, The Lord shall, and I'm reading the King James, I should say, the, The Lord shall be a king over the earth in that day. Shall there be one Lord, and his name is one. When the Lord will finally come rule and reign after that white throne judgment, after again the sheep and the goats have been separated, that millennial king, he's going to rule and reign. The only God, the true God. Now Joel, again, uses the, the recent invasion, as I've talked about, and this is important to understand, of the, the locust that we saw in chapter 1. He uses it as a springboard to warn the impending attack upon Israel by punishing the army, again, commanded by God. God's going to send a judgment down upon the land. And most scholars will say this is Assyria. I don't know for sure. It's not clear. And some say it's Babylon. But it's really foreshadowing that great final battle and we'll see that especially in chapter 3 where they gather to fight against the Lord. Now look with me in Joel chapter 2 verse 11 and it says the, the Lord utters his voice before his army. Surely his camp is very great for strong is he who carries out his word and the day of the Lord is indeed great and very awesome. Who can endure it? 
And this is a very, very important to understand. Who can endure it? This talking about, in its primary sense, that final day of the Lord when judgment is coming. Who can stand against the Lord? Now, God is using this army that we're going to see. Whether it be Syrians or Babylonians, we don't know. We've already discussed. We don't know exact timing. But he's using it to show this locust is something that's going to be much greater, and this is what he's showing us, something that's going to happen in the future. Now, certainly the Lord disciplines him all the way, looking to bring a remnant to himself. What we do learn is it's a day of darkness. It's an overwhelming day of darkness. In fact... In the very beginning, in verse 1 of chapter 2, it begins with, Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, and surely it is near. So there's this announcement. Blow the trumpet. The shofar is what would be used. It was a calling of worship. It was calling, again, at times, a calling of battle or, or just a simply gathering the people together. But here, again, it says, blow the trumpet on Zion. Zion interchangeable for Jerusalem. Now, it, it can mean, again, all of Jerusalem or it could mean just one particular hill. It's the place where God said that he would meet with his people. That's what's important. He says, sound the alarm on that holy mountain. So many scholars believe it's Zion there. Notice it says, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. Because it is going to be so terrifying. And and this is meant really to be a warning. How many times you heard that the Lord is coming soon. And and people, they, they just don't pay attention. But you and I know as believers, he will come. He's fulfilled every promise up to this date that he said he would do. There's no reason why he won't fulfill the rest of the promises. And he calls it for the day of the Lord is coming and surely it's near. Near in many ways because judgment will fall upon them because they're disobedient, they're worshiping idols, they're sacrificing their own kids. Sadly, They're in just direct rebellion to God. And this is the reason they're in this place. So commentators have divided the identity, as I mentioned. Notice it's invading, and we're going to see this army from the north. All the armies, everything comes from the north. So it could be Assyria. It could be Babylon. We know in that final battle, they will cross the Euphrates and, and come down to Israel. So there are those, again, as I mentioned, that have a different view, and, and they see all this as figurative. The locust invasion in chapter 1, and some see it as a literal enemy coming again from the north, described as invading locusts. But when we come to Revelation, Revelation 9-3, you can mark that down. 3 through 11 compares the demonic forces to locusts. See, it's not saying they are locusts, but it likens it. It compares them to locusts, the way they they come down, they swarm the land. Whether this army was man or insect, it represented a judgment force that was coming by the Lord. The Lord is the judge of this land. Do we really fear the Lord? Fear meaning two things. The fear of the Lord can be that reverential fear, and if we do, then we... We want to be very cautious. We don't want to sin against the Lord. We don't want to sin against another person. But fear is for the unbeliever. The God that spoke all things in existence will come down and judge mankind. And it's too late when he comes. You cannot make a decision, say, Lord, I'll believe in you now when he's he's coming. It's too late. This is why the warning is going out. And we need to send the warning out. Because the time is closer than ever before. See, Joel is a spiritual watchman. He sounds the alarm. Just as all the other prophets did. 
prophet was called to sound the alarm to the nation of, of, of Israel. And again, it's the place where the temple would have stood if the temple was there. It's the place, again, where God said his name would be stamped upon that hill, marked upon that hill. Zion is the place of the Lord's throne. And generally refers, again, as I mentioned, again, signifying the whole city of Jerusalem, but, but primarily to those at temple time, the temple region. Whether the temple was there or was not there, all would know. If you went to Israel today, you could see the temple mount, and you can see where the temple stood. You can see where the temple will be built side by side that mosque. Just as the Bible describes the court of the Gentiles to be set apart and the temple will be built right there, both at the same time fulfilling other prophecies. See, the warning is, again, a fear of the coming of the Lord. Some people will maybe not be fearful now, but they will be ashamed at his coming because they have not taken as serious as they should. They've not been faithful to their, their calling. They've worried about things that are really unimportant. Maybe materialism, maybe their home life, whatever it would be. They haven't put the Lord first. Many places in the scriptures seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness. You know, add all things, he'll take care of things. But, but sometimes people are seeking their kingdom now, professing to believe in the Lord building their own homes, and certainly we see this happening in the scripture from time to time. And God has to rebuke them. The day of danger is near at hand, the prophet says. He has a burden on his, his heart to get that word out for people to listen to him. I believe he grieves. He weeps. He pleads with God. See, the the day of danger is near. It's looming over them in this sense, and it's threatening them. The atmosphere around them, they know something is about to happen, whether something that is not exactly what he's talking about, but some type of a judgment just to wake them up. We know today it can't go on the way it's going now. We see this world becoming more and more sinful, more self-centered, selfish, worried about everything that's unimportant. There's only one thing that's important in this world right now, and that's our relationship with Jesus Christ. Because if you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, when he returns, you will be judged. And this is the warning here. Proverbs, again says this in Proverbs 11, 4, Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. And then in Isaiah 2, 12, it says, For the Lord of hosts will have a day of reckoning against everyone who is proud and lofty, against everyone who is lifted up, that he may be abased. And then again in Isaiah Chapter 13, verse 13, Therefore I will make the heavens tremble, and the earth will be shaken from its place at the fury of the Lord of hosts in that day, in the day of his burning anger. Again in Isaiah, chapter 34, verse 8, And the Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of recompense for the cause of Zion. And finally, here in Jeremiah 30, verse 7, Alas, the day is great, there is none like it, and it is the time of Jacob's distress. But he will be saved from it. See, there is a time of judgment coming. The warning has been coming and coming and coming. How, how many times are we going to hear the warning before we get our house in order? That's really what the text is teaching. When are we going to take his word seriously? Will we continue in sin? Will we continue in rebellion? Will we continue living for ourselves? Or will we be living for him? Look with me in verse 2. We see really the tack, the description of that day of the Lord. 
And this description lines up exactly what you would expect it does whenever it's talking about this day of the Lord, and especially in the book of Revelation. Notice it's a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. As the dawn is spread over the mountains, so there is a great and mighty people. There has never been anything like it, nor will there be anything again after it to the years of many generations. So you can see when this time comes, there will never be another day like it. This is going to be the most severe time of judgment the world has ever seen. So any of the other things that would come and the battles would come and the discipline would come, it's only to bring the people back to him. Back into his loving arms. This is the reason for the warning. The darkness recalls the Lord's appearance at Mount Sinai. God's appearance at Sinai foreshadows this day, the day of judgment in the future. Let me read from Amos 5, verse 18 and 20. says this, Alas, you who are longing for the day of the Lord, for what purpose will the day of the Lord be to you? It will be darkness and not light. And when a man flees from a lion, the bear meets him or goes home and leans on his hand against the wall, the snake bites him. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness instead of light? Even gloom with no brightness in it. Isaiah 64 verse 1 says this, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence. See, the people did believe that he was going to come down, but they were okay with themselves. Let me ask you a question. Are you okay with yourself? Your attitudes, your actions, your choices, your lifestyle, your plans, are they apart from God or are you in the middle of God's will? Scripture is clear that we should keep ourselves right in the love of God Jude talks about. Where God can bless us, where God can focus on us and minister to us and use us for his glory. Zephaniah and Joel have very, a lot of similarities, let's say. Let me show you. Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 14 through 17. Near is that great day of the Lord. Near and coming very quickly. Listen, the day of the Lord. And its warrior cries out bitterly, the day of wrath is that day, a day of trouble and distress, a day of destruction and desolation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and the high corner towers, and I will bring distress on men so they will walk like a, the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Notice they sinned against the Lord. And their blood will be poured out like the dust and their flesh like dung. See, this day of the Lord will come suddenly. This most powerful army will come down. When they say peace and safety, destruction will come. Are you ready? See, it's, this chapter really is about warning. It's not knowing about just history. It's about knowing God. God's going to reveal his character in this chapter. Remind us of who he is. He's wanting every one of us to repent, to return. I imagine every one of us here tonight, there's something that we need to repent in our life. If we're honest with ourselves, and God knows Revelation 6, verse 16 and 17 says this, and, and they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall upon us and hide us from the presence of him who sits upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of that wrath has come. Who is able to stand? Book after book, all through the Bible is this warning. And man's failed to yield to the warning. You and I have been given great knowledge. We have the Bible in our hands. 
we're in a time where we can turn on the radio and hear Christian radio, Christian teaching, and, and take the Bible out and read and compare it, be Bereans, and see if it's so. It's a time that you and I can recognize the seasons, just as the scripture says in Matthew 24. We should recognize, and we, we know that time is nearer than ever before. Israel had a time like that that they could recognize, but they failed. He's warning them and, and, and this hope that they should be looking for his coming. Notice many people prefer to be crushed, tumbled under the rocks and the mountains, rather to endure the judgment of God, the wrath of the Lamb. Stubborn, right? to the end unwilling to say you are God and I was wrong it's too late for them at that point to, to realize that it, it, there's, it's too late to receive the Lord they've already made their choices there's a verse a set of verses that have always encouraged me. It's 1 John chapter 3, 1 through 3. If you want to avoid the, the coming judgment that will come upon this world, first we need to receive the Lord, be born again. But 1 John 3, 1 through 3 says this, See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we would be called children of God. And such we are. Isn't that just an th amazing thought that God would call us his children? So father gathers his children, loves his children. That's our father. For this reason, the world doesn't know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God. It has not appeared yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. And here's the punchline, and everyone who has this hope fixed upon him purifies himself just as he's pure. We need to be looking for the coming of the Lord. Any day, Lord, this would be a good day. This would be a good night. Thinking if this could be the day, it, it directs our course in one direction. But if we're not looking for the Lord, we're going to veer this way and that way. You can't. I can't change my life. Can you change your life? Can you change your destiny apart from God? Can you be good enough? No way can you be good enough. The only thing you can do is look to the Lord. Trust to the Lord and lean not on your own understanding. Look with me in verse 3. Verse 3 says this, a fire consumes before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but a desolate wilderness behind them, and nothing at all escapes them. It's not surprising that this would be said, because this is what we call, again, this, this imagery in the Bible. It speaks regarding to the, the coming judgment Joel describes the destruction of this invading army. What it would be like? It would be like a, a consuming fire. I don't know if you've ever seen fields of fire just going. I remember when I was on the mainland for a few years, and we would see just whole acres and acres and acres, hundreds of acres just burn up in a matter of, of minutes. And he's describing this is how fast it will be, total destruction, Nothing left alive. Joel 1, 19 says this, To you, O Lord, I cry, for the fire has devoured the pastures, pastures of the wilderness, and the flame has burned up the trees of the field. This is a result of the locusts that had come down and, and the devastation, and, and everything was dry and brittle and burned. Is describing the destructive power of the great and mighty people that would come down. It could only be compared to the devastation brought to God's original creation. Think about that. When God created the heaven and earth, it was good, very good. It was, in fact, it was perfect. And then God created man. 
Man sinned and rebelled against God. Let me read in Genesis 3, 17 through 19. And then Adam, he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat in all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you. And you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. That curse, that original curse that came. God will judge. God's giving you every opportunity to walk with him, to trust with him, to rest in him, to walk in abundant life. If you're not walking in abundant life, then there's a problem with your relationship. You're letting other things get in the way between you and God. Look again in Genesis 13, verse 10. Lot lifted up his eyes and saw the valley of Jordan. It was well watered everywhere. It was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go to Zor. This lush, beautiful land destroyed was Sodom and Gomorrah and burned. And God will destroy this place one day with fire and brimstone. Ezekiel 36, 35 says this, and they will say, this desolate land has become like a garden of Eden and the waste and the desolate and ruined cities are fortified and it happens. See, there's still hope. There's hope tonight for the person who has never trusted in the Lord to turn to the Lord and repent. Maybe for the one that says he's walking with the Lord but is walking in habitual sin. Galatians lists those, again, deeds of flesh. The person who continually walks in these will not inherit the kingdom of God. The person who continue lives a life of lying, stealing, murdering, adultery. Habitual lifestyle. He's calling people to repent even tonight. Isaiah 51, 3 says, Indeed, the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all of her waste places and her wildernesses and, and will make it like Eden. And her desert will be like the garden of the Lord and joy and gladness will be found in her and thanksgiving and sound of melody. See, the Lord wants to return everything that the locust has eaten, everything that destroyed, whether it be your, your marriage, your job, You've wasted your life. He wants to give you abundance now. Notice again as he continues in verse 4, then the appearance is like the appearance of horses. In these next few verses, in verse 4 and 5, you'll see the word like, 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 and like. Follow as I read it again. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses. Not saying it is horses. It's like, and like war horses. So they run. And with the noise of chariots, they leap on the top of mountains like the crackling of a flame, a fire consuming the stubble, like a mighty people arranged the battle. This is very important. Liking is just giving a comparison. They don't, they don't know how to describe what he's seen in this vision, so he gives the best way that he can explain it. When Germany overran the entire countries in World War II, so this army was like a locust, would gallop on war horses as the tanks moved in large numbers. The infantry, the planes, the deafening sound of their charge was like a roaring forest on fire compared to the sounds heard on the coming day of the Lord. That's the comparison. Verse 6, it says this, but there the people are in anguish, and all their faces turn pale. Fear grips them. It grips all the people, anticipating the, the invasion. They, they recognize now is the time. It's, it's too late. It's too late to repent, to change. 
It's going to be a time that we'll see in a moment that they're to cry out for the Lord, cry out for mercy. Maybe he might just change his mind or, as the scripture says, repent. All the people, the nations, will be terrorized, thrown into convulsions in what's called this day of the judgment. Look with me in verses 7 through 8. They run like mighty men. They climb the wall like soldiers. Each march in a line. Nor do they deviate from their paths. They do not crowd each other. They march everyone in their path. And when they burst through the defenses, they do not break ranks. A well-trained, finely trained army. In the book of Judges, chapter 6, verse 5, Notice what it says. For they would come up with their livestock, their tents. They would come up like locusts for number. Both they and their camels were innumerable. And they came into the land to devastate it. Isaiah 33, 4 says this. Your spoil is gathered as caterpillar gathers, as locusts is rushing about men rush about it. In Jeremiah 51, 14 The Lord of hosts has sworn by himself, surely I will fill you with the population like locusts, and they will cry out with shouts of victory over you. Note the armies are compared to locusts, and sometimes locusts are in the scripture compared to armies. You see this imagery go back and forth. In Proverbs 30, verse 27, it says this, locusts have no king, yet all of them go out in ranks. Another translation says, like an army. Joel continues the interplay of soldiers and imagery and actions in this locust plague. Just as the swarming locusts ate everything in the fields. And then they came to the city, the houses, and they breached the walls, and they plundered the houses. It's just following the same pattern. But, but everything in this chapter is pointing to the day of the Lord, that final day. Joel uses the end-time language, move beyond what happens in normal locusts. Or even military invasions. He goes much beyond that. The very heavens were now engaged. And Yahweh, I I use the term Yahweh, Lord, capital L-O-R-D, referring to that covenant God, the, the covenant God and his heavenly armies. We're really ready to Wreak havoc. The judgment day is come. Yet the situation is not without hope. If they would just repent before they come. They can recognize the times and seasons just as we do today. But will the people today repent? Will we repent? That's always the question. See, When we begin in verse 11, we're going to see this call to repentance. We find it in every single book of the Bible. In fact, if we look at creation in chapter 1, he created the heavens, the earth, and man, and and marriage. And chapter 3 on is about God trying to bring man back to himself. He wants us to be the apple of his eye, and certainly we're the apple of his eye, but, but we can choose not to be his. Verse 11 says, The Lord utters his voice before the army. Surely his camp is very great, for strong is he who carries out his word, speaking of obedience. The day of the Lord is indeed great and very awesome. Again, who can endure it? Did you notice in verse 11, the Lord utters his voice before the army. He's speaking to them, directing them. How he spoke, whether it's audible or just to their hearts, he's the one that's in control of history. See, it's in verses 12 through 17. The focus is really this this need to turn back to the Lord. Not only to turn back to the Lord, but it's this congregational lamenting and weeping before the Lord. 
And, and in that culture, it would be uh, to put on sackcloth and mourn and weep, weep over their, their sin. But what's important is there's this genuine, true repentance, sincere repentance. Because it's easy to say what we did and go do it again and again and again in a habitual lifestyle. This must be done as far as repentance before, prior to the day of the Lord. This is what he's teaching here. Look with me in verse 12. There needs to be a change in attitude. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Now return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, compassionate and slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and relenting of evil. God's declaring who he is, reminding him of these very things that were first spoken again to, to Moses in Exodus 34, 6, and then in Numbers and Jonah and Nahum and Psalms, Nehemiah and, and, and Second Chronicles. Return, repent and re return. The phrase, yet even so, it, uh, this is the, the Lord's declaration. There's still hope if you'd only turn. Let me read again from Second Chronicles. It says this in chapter 33, verse 10 through 13, the Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they paid no attention. Therefore the Lord brought the commanders of the army of the king of Syria against them. They captured Manasseh with hooks and bound him with bronze chains and took him to Babylon. And when he was in distress, he entreated the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before God of his fathers. And when he prayed to him, he was moved by his entreaty and heard the supplication, and brought him back to Jerusalem in his kingdom. And then Manasseh knew the Lord was God. You know, there's an expression you'll see in the Bible, the Lord your God. That, that expression was well known to, again, Israel, because it's used 263 times in Deuteronomy alone. The Lord your God. Reminded him that he's in a covenant relationship. You're in a covenant, and I'm in a covenant relationship with the Lord in that new covenant. How many times does the Lord have to remind us that we're in this covenant relationship? What will we do when we're confronted with sin and rebellion? A common verse most people recognize is 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 12 through 16. Let me read. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. If I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among the people, and my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open, my ears attentive to the prayer offered in this place. For now I've chosen and consecrated this house, that my name may be, be there forever, and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Now, the first context, the first primary meaning, this is to Israel. This is a, a promise that God gave to Israel. But when we look at the very character of God, this is who God is. He's wanting us to come to our senses. He's wanting us to quit sinning. He's wanting us to trust in him and lean not on our own understanding. And he will hear our prayers. And he will forgive our sins. And he'll heal our land. In Isaiah 30, verse 18, Therefore the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore he waits upon high to have compassion upon you. For the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are those who long for him. God's looking to pour his grace out 
His love upon us each and every day, but we're so busy with our own lives, we rarely really experience the love of God that he has for each and every one of us. Before this can ever happen, it, the Lord requires something. Sincere, genuine repentance. Even as I'm speaking, a person can confess and repent right here and get right with the Lord. Verse 14 continues, who knows whether he would, will not return and relent and leave a blessing behind him, even a grain offering or a drink offering for the Lord your God. Think with me for a moment, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 22. And he said, while the child was still alive, referring to David who had a child through Bathsheba, I fasted, I wept, for I said, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me that the child may live. God, it speaks of his sovereignty. Sometimes he extends graciousness here and graciousness near, but not here or not there, and we don't understand the, the big picture, but God knows the hearts of the people. The heart of God is he wants to lavish us with his grace, his mercy, his love. You remember the story of Jonah? Jonah chapter 3 verse 9 says, Who knows, God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that, that they will not perish. The story of Jonah is interesting because Jonah despised the Assyrians. He didn't want to be a messenger and bring that message. But in the end, when the, the message finally went out, the king, the people, the city as a whole repented. Sackcloth, ashes, mourning over their sin. But what happened to this country if the country got down on its knees and prayed, confessed their sins and repented and decided no longer to walk in sin? Verse 15 Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, and proclaim a solemn assembly. The blowing of the shofar, as I mentioned, the, a trumpet on Zion. It, it's repeated twice in this text, but this one is, is not a, a call to, to military, a warning. That it, it's, again, religious. They need to return. That's always God's message, that we would return to to think that we're always walking in the Spirit, always walking in the Lord. We're not. We're sinners saved by grace, faith. The trumpet does not call the country to war, but to worship. The worship is, is again, worship that is not praise and adoration and joy. We love doing that. But that does not please God if our heart is not right with him. See, this is the call. The, the worship is, is to be from desperation. It's, it's the seeking of deliverance from the disaster that lay ahead. It's prayer. It's not looking at someone else, finding fault with someone else. It's, it's letting God look at my own heart and show me my own sin. Lord, search me and see if there's any wicked way. Do you know your motives, why you say, why you do what you do sometimes? No, I, I don't think so any more than me. Other, I'm, other than I'm a sinner saved by grace. And I'm his workmanship and he will finish it. And that's true in every believer. But many are deceiving themselves. And this is what was happening with Israel. They were deceiving themselves. Yeah, they were right with God but they really weren't. 
Notice the assembling of the entire community, in this case in verse 16, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, the nursing infants, let the bridegroom come out of his room and the bride out of her bridal chamber. It's, it's bring everyone together. It's time for everyone to come. Even those who normally were exempt from such gatherings, it's time. This is seriousness. And this is something that, that we need to take our faith very serious. Because he could come at any moment. Are we really believers? Do we really believe he's coming again? If so, then it, we have this urgent message, this warning, looking for where the Lord is leading that we might speak to someone. The priests were given special instructions because they were to lead the people. The people in an expression of a, a national lament and petition. I would love to see When you go to a, a football game or something, and there's 50,000 people in the stadium. Can you imagine 50,000 people falling on their knees, crying out to God? Father, forgive us, for we do not know what we've done. Father, forgive them, for they, we, they do not know what they have done. But see, as I mentioned earlier, and when I talked about, again, the Syrians, Nineveh, the whole city repented. And God extended that grace. Verse 17 in our text says, Let the priest, the Lord's ministers, weep before the porch and the altar. Let them say, Spare your people, O Lord. Do not make your inheritance a reproach a byword among the nations. Why should they among the people say, where is their God? Some have taken this to mean, why, why should the nations uh, rule over us? This view fits the interpretation for, for many of the, the northern army invasion. They see it, it fits the, the locus. But in the end, God will still judge those who have not repented. Look at verse 18 for a second. The Lord will be, again, then the Lord will be zealous for his land and will have pity upon his people. That word, zealous, oftentimes means, again, jealousy. God is, God is jealous for you. He's not jealous that he's going to lose you. But he knows the consequences that you're going to go if you're not walking with him. He knows, uh, again, the discipline, the consequences, the, the loss of a marriage or whatever it may be in your life. And he's, again, jealous for you. Ezekiel 39, 25 says this, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Now I will restore the fortunes of Jacob and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel, and I will be jealous for my holy name. And then in Zechariah chapter 1, verse 14, so the angel who was speaking to me said to me, proclaim, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, I'm exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion. In Zechariah 8, 2, it says, thus says the Lord of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous again for Zion. Yes, with great wrath I am jealous for her. God finds no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. God wants all to come to, again, to repentance, saving knowledge of him and repentance. Verse 19, our last verse, says this, the Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I'm going to send your grain and new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied and full with them, and I will never again make you a reproach among the nations. This is something that will only be happen at the millennial kingdom because, again, Israel is a reproach among the nations now, so this couldn't even be fulfilled now. It ties with the rest of the text. See, Joel announces the Lord's decision to, 
to turn away from his judgment and spare them. There, there's those that are confessing and repenting and returning to the Lord. Starting here in verse 19, the Lord will speak, we'll see next week, directly to the people. His covenant blessings will be restored and the people be protected from their enemies. The Lord is wanting to restore in your life and my life what the locust has eaten. The question is, is that what we want? Do we want to return to the Lord with all of our heart and mind and soul and strength and say, Lord, here I am. Confess our sins. Confess that we need him. Confess that we've drifted from him. Apart from you, Lord, we know, as the scripture says, we can do nothing, nothing apart from you of good. Father, thank you tonight for your word. As powerful as it is, it reveals that you are a holy God. You must judge sin. Yet you are merciful to those who will confess and repent and turn back to you. Lord, that's our desire. Show us our sins tonight that we might confess. We will not let those things rule our life, but we let your spirit rule our life and guide us in all truth. Thank you for the hope that we have in you, Jesus. Thank you for your faithfulness to Israel to be patient and long-suffering and compassionate with them. For, Lord, we know these things are true in you, the you will be true to us as well. Lord Jesus, in your precious name we pray. Amen. I am not skilled to understand What God has willed, what God has planned I only know at His right hand Stand one who is my Savior I take Him at His word and deed Christ died to save me, this I read. And in my heart I find a need For Him to be my Savior That He would leave His place on high And come for sinful men to die you count each train so once did I Before I knew my Savior My Savior loves, my Savior lives My Savior's always there for me My God He was, my God He is My God He's always gonna be Yes, living, dying, let me bring my strength, my solace from the spring That he who lives to be my king Once died to be my savior That he would leave his place on high And come for sinful man to die you counted strength, so once did I Before I knew my Savior My Savior loves, my Savior lives My Savior is always there for me My God, He was, my God, He is My God, He's always gonna be My Savior loves, my Savior lives My Savior is always there for me 
My God, he was, my God, he is, my God, he's always going to be. I am not skilled to understand what God has willed, what God has planned. I only know at his right hand. Stand one who is my Savior. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We thank you and praise you, Lord, for your word. Lord, we thank you that we can call you Father. And because of what we did, we, what your son did, Lord, and we put our trust in him, Lord. Tonight we put our trust in him every day. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.